recording. And we're live. Okay. Hello, ladies. Welcome to Sestra Now 1000 Women Campaign Finance Committee. Tonight, we will be doing part two of Reclaiming Your Financial Power, subtitled Tracking Your Way to Financial Freedom. My name is Diane Mullings, officially known as Princess, and I'm the team lead for Savings Team. And alongside me is Renee Blackwood, Angela Edwards, Angela Henry, Talisha Lopez, and Cal Midwinter Faulkner. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from Angela Edwards, Renee Blackwood, and Angela Henry. But before we start, let me give you a brief summary of what they do. Angela Edwards received her BS and Master's in Engineering from Columbia University and an Accounting Certification from NYU. She's a certified public person buyer and is a certified at Six Sigma Green Belt. She has over 20 years of procurement, consulting, contract, and project management experience in leadership roles in both public and private sectors. Angela has found that the key to managing extensive project portfolios is utilizing our analytical and negotiating skills to implement strategic plans, change management, and process involvement. Most important to achieve this skill set is data analysis, a significant part of which is tracking. Renee Blackwood received her Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from the University of Maryland and her Master's of Arts in Organizational psycho Psychology from Columbia University. She has over 15 years of work experience as a human resource professional and is a personal finance enthusiast. Angela Henry has over two decades of experience in the area of supply logic logistics with both government and city agencies. She's a licensed agent and coach in the field of financial literacy. See, she assists individuals with families through education and awareness to have a better financial foundation for the future. She seeks out trained apprentice individuals to do what she does to help build their own business in the financial industry. Now, let's hear from our amazing saving team. I now turn over to Angela Edwards. Angela? Good evening, ladies. Welcome to the second uh, part of our savings uh, workshop. At this time, I will start sharing my screen. Okay, thank you for that lovely introduction, Diane. And so now let's begin with the working definition of tracking. What is tracking? Tracking in the simplest form is monitoring and keeping a record of your income and expenses, enabling you to identify spending habits and make adjustments to improve your finances, ensuring that you remain within your budget and helping you to get an accurate picture of where your money is and where you like it to go. Here are three questions I would like for you to ask yourself. Do you know where your money is going? On a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Do you have, um, do you have change for 10? Um, no, no. Sorry, I think. So. We need to mute someone. The second question, do you have plans for the future and wonder how you will achieve them? Third, are you interested in learning how to change your spending habits? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you are in the right place at the right time. The savings team is here to help you track your expenses and set realistic goals by offering you strategies and free resources. So let's take a minute to think about why you should track your expenses. The ultimate goal is to always know where your money is, right? You, you receive an income and you know you have money coming in 
but do you know where your money is going? Another reason you want to track your expenses is to set realistic savings goals. Last week, we talked about SMART goals. And so we need to be realistic in setting those goals. And ultimately, before you build a budget, you need to track your spending to understand your habits and to identify opportunities to save money. Again, you want to be able to identify those areas that you need improvement. And in order to do so, you have to identify your habits. What are some of the benefits of tracking? Let's look at some of the key benefits. Tracking is about managing or changing your present to achieve something in the future. We all have a picture for the future, what our goals, what goals we want to achieve, but we also must have a clear picture of where our money is going and make the necessary adjustments to ensure that the money will get us where we want to go. If you've established a budget, a spending plan, then you want to see that you are staying within those limits and to curb your spending habits. Again, the goal tonight is to show you how to do it and why to do it. So let's look at some tracking methods. Tonight we'll discuss five of them. The first one is the old fashioned pen and paper, right? So for most people, it's easier just to keep track of it. You have paper, you have a pen, you grab a pen and you write it down. You write down what the it is. The it could be your income, it could be your expenses and you'll put those expenses in different categories. For example, your mortgage or your rent, utilities, food, transportation. And so you write those down on paper and you keep track of it. That works for some people. For others, they prefer to do a ledger. And I'm not talking about the accounting ledger with, um, it, with, that you track on the computer system or that most businesses do. We're talking about on the simple level. So in the simplest form for personal use, a ledger is something that you would use to write down a record of transactions into different accounts. So a personal ledger functions similar to a checkbook, right? The basic personal ledger uses a single entry accounting system where your income is on one side and your expenses are on the other. You have two columns, you can put dates and descriptions, but basically you're showing what you take in and where it's going. The next type of uh, tracking method is the envelope system. And with that, you can get fancy envelopes, you can get simple envelopes, whichever one that you want. But basically you're labeling different categories, similar ca categories to what we talked about earlier. And here you now put the money in the envelope. So if you allocate $100 for rent, you know, $50 for food, whatever amount, you put it in those envelopes. And that's where you'll go to when you need to spend money on that rent, when you need to uh, get your rent together, your mortgage together, or if you need food, you go to the envelope that's labeled food. So the concept is very simple. You just want to have categories for each one and then put the money in there that you plan to use to spend on those items. And that's one good way of not overspending. When the envelope is empty, when the money is finished, it's done, as we say. And then you no longer are able to spend on that particular category. So if that's simply enough for you, I encourage you to use it. The next um, type of method is a spreadsheet. Here you have a little bit more sophisticate, sophistication, I should say. You can create a simple spreadsheet. Um, Excel has a, um, a simple tem template that's available for everyone. You can use a more complicated one, or you can use the one that we shared last week. When Diane did her presentation, she showed a spreadsheet that we'll make available to everyone um, once this is posted. So again, you can use a spreadsheet if, if 
the paper and pen doesn't work for you, if the ledger doesn't work for you, if the envelope system doesn't work for you, 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 you have the spreadsheet that you can track. I personally like, like the spreadsheet, but again, this we're presenting different methods and for you to make a choice as to which one works best for you. With the spreadsheet, you can put in formulas, you can do pivot tables, you can get your reports out. Again, which one, whichever method that's comfortable for you, use, use, those me use that method, sorry. And for those who are super tech savvy, there are a myriad of apps that they can use. Some are free and others that you would uh, pay a nominal fee for it. At this time, I will ask one of my teammates, Renee Blackwood, to speak about her experience using the different apps. Renee, I'll stop sharing. Sure. So, um, and I've actually used a variety and still continue to use a variety of different methods for tracking my own budget. Um, I started with Excel and did Excel for years. And when I got to a point where I wanted something simpler and wanted to find technology to support that, I started looking into apps. Um, one of the first apps I used um, was based on the envelope method that Angie mentioned a little while ago. Um, and I used two in that area. The first was Good Budget, which had a free version that we were able to, to use and to leverage with setting up different virtual envelopes. And um, the free version, unfortunately, you can't connect it with your bank to automatically bring in tr um, transactions. So I ended up switching to another app called Envelopes. So it's the word envelope with an M in front of it. And that one does have a nominal monthly fee or you can pay for an annual subscription, but that one does allow you to link it directly to your account. So as soon as a transaction comes in, you can assign it to an envelope and automatically deduct whatever money that you have put in there. And similarly, when you get your paycheck, you assign your paycheck to the different envelopes so that you have money set aside for different things. I used envelopes for a while and was pretty satisfied with it. And I don't remember this specifically, but there was something that I felt was missing and I started looking for another option. And now currently I use um, primarily an app called YNAB, Y-N-A-B, which stands for You Need a Budget. And it's a similar kind of concept. They're not officially envelopes, they're just categories. But basically when you have income, you assign your income to different categories and you can track spending in those categories. And again, it's linked to your account, which is helpful because you get to see all transactions and make sure everything is covered. Now, if you have an account that's not linked, you're gonna have an issue with that. But once you do have your accounts linked, it's simple in the sense that you see everything coming in and you're able to categorize and track your spending in a simple way. And if you're going over budget in one category, you can move money around um, to be able to adjust for that. So one good thing about, yeah, yeah, YNAB, excuse me, is that it tries to prevent you from having negative categories. So if you're overspending in one area, it does raise that for you and flag that and ask you to, to move money around to adjust that. So it helps to bring a bit more discipline and help you to really be on track of your income, your expenses, and where everything is going. And to do something like savings as well, it's a good tool because you can have a category for savings and allocate money towards that and see how that grows over time. Um, there are other apps out there, and if you research, you know, budget apps, you'll find a myriad of them. Those are just a few of the ones that, that I use and I've had good experiences with, and I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Renee. Um, so at this time, I'll share my screen again, and so we'll continue with the presentation. Um, so we talked about the different methods. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Now we're stuck. Okay, here we go. And now let's talk about the steps in, um, in tracking. So the first thing that we recommend is that you check your statements, your bank statements, your, um, you can look at your pay stub, whatever it is where that you, you're looking to analyze what you have coming in and what you'll need to go out. You put those expenses in categories. And so we mentioned earlier rent, food, clothing, transportation, any categories that, that you spend money in, 
you should categorize and, and uh, in order to track those specific areas. Use one of the methods that we described earlier. Um, again, recommending that you use whichever one you're most comfortable with, whichever one works best for you and your family. Review the method, review uh, your spending, and to make the necessary adjustments as needed. So as Renee just mentioned, you, you don't want to have a negative in your category, whether you're using the envelope or you're using the app or um, the, the ledger, whichever one. You wanna make sure the, the goal here is to monitor. And if you see that, okay, I have allocated X number of uh, say $50 and now I see you know, it's the middle of the month and I'm already, I've already maxed it out. Then you need to make adjustments. Look at, should I be spending that much on that category or do I need to allocate more? So you'll make adjustments. You're not, you're not pinned to that particular amount in that category, but the goal here is to analyze, to analyze, to see what needs to be shifted to make those adjustments so that it's um, so that you're achieving those goals that, that you've set for yourself. Last week we talked about budget, and you'll hear us saying that repeatedly. Stick to your budget. If you stick within your budget, you should be fine. And again, a budget is not set in stone, but it is there as a guide. And if you stick to it, or if you see that you need to make adjustments, by all means do so. We highly recommend that you switch to cash only. And by that, we mean if you, whether it's cash itself, a debit card, or something that we recently learned about was a secure card where um, with the secure card, is it works like a credit card, but you're paying, you, you have deposit upfront. So again, trying to use your money as opposed to using someone else's money um, where you're paying a higher interest, unless you have enough money to pay off that bill at the end of the month. And if needed, use a separate spending account. Um, some people have different banks, bank accounts. You may set one aside that's specifically for spending. And so you have a separate one for savings. So if you need to split your accounts in, in that way, by all means do so. Again, the goal is that you will be monitoring and your spending and making sure that you stay within budget and you don't overspend. So in closing, whether it's 21 days, 90 days, or somewhere in between, developing a habit of saving is possible. We all use our phones and computers, so inst installing a habit reinforcing app can increase your chances of success. Uh, you heard the testimony from Renee, and so if you're comfortable with an app, there's so many out there from simple to highly complex, Again, play around with them, especially those that are free. Or ask around, ask family and friends, ask us, you know, which ones that we've used. We're happy to share that information with you. Remember, you have the power to control your spending. You have the power to control your spending. You have the power to control how much you save. Know the big picture. Know what goals that you want to achieve and take the necessary steps that will help you to not only save towards that, but leave, leave a legacy for your family. And at this time, I will turn the presentation over to my teammate, Angela Henry. Hi, good evening, everyone. Let me just bring up my screen. Thank you also, Diane, for such a wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction. I feel so special. Um, <laughs> so can you guys see my, I, I think you can see my screen. I'm just trying to get it to um, present. Okay, so um, what I'm going to be talking about moving forward and to kind of tie this all up in a nice little bow um, from our part one is I'm going to be talking about retirement savings. That's your long-term savings, something that 
whether you just are getting into the workforce or whether you are have been working for some time now, you should always be thinking about the end, the end result, right? Um, building a firm financial building a firm financial foundation is critical. And it all starts with that B word that we've been talking about um, for the past two weeks and it's the budget. So what I want you guys to think about is, um, you know, like when someone's building a house, they don't build it from the top down, they build it from the bottom going up. So the foundation of building for our long-term savings, for our retirement starts with our budget. Sometimes budget has like a dark cloud over it. So we're gonna call it a spending plan. Maybe that'll help you a little bit better. And basically what that is, is knowing how much income is coming in, how much is going out every month in expenses and finding out if you have any discretionary money, which is money left over or whether you have more month at the end of your money. You have to start with the budget. Once you've established your spending plan and you know where your money is going and it's not just running around all willy nilly that you are giving your money an assignment by putting it in those envelopes, by downloading those apps. The next thing you're gonna work on is debt elimination because you can't truly do any saving, any substantial saving if you're in debt, right? Now, a lot of people know that they're in debt. They don't really understand how they got in. And a lot of them, if they work their way out or crawl their way out, they don't, real, they don't know exactly what they did. So they end up back in debt. It's like a revolving door. And the banks and the lenders love that. So the faster you get out of debt is the better. It also takes you putting a plan into place. If you don't know how to do it, if you're not literate on exactly how debt works and how it's working against you, then I, I advise you to sit down with someone who knows a little bit about you know, financial literacy, about money that can give you some insight on what you can do to put a plan together to get out of debt faster and to stay out of debt. After you have eliminated your debt, you're gonna work on emergency funds. Emergency funds being the cash that is in the bank, um, more you know, what better a credit union rather than you know just a bank because you may get a better savings rate if you're in a credit union if that's available to you, um, and not just the three to six months like you've heard that saying for so long. After this pandemic, one thing that we've learned is we need more like twelve months of our monthly expenses stashed away somewhere in case of a leaky roof, in case your tires blow on your car. Um, just any reason that you can put your hands on some cash rather than swiping that card and then going down in that building of house and back down into debt. We don't want to do that. The next thing we want to do is think about our short-term goals. And I want you to add a, add a fun bucket to that, okay? Not just everything is being so stringent. You have to give yourself little, you know, reward yourself for all of the work you're doing, putting a plan together, getting out of debt, building that emergency fund, like put a little something aside so that you know that you can do something nice for yourself. But those short-term goals, one to five years, maybe, you know, saving to pay cash for a vehicle, down, down payment for a home, um, just anything, maybe that, that nice vacation you want to go on, something that you can pay cash with rather than, again, swiping that card because somebody put in a chat that the credit cards are the devil and you know that's not too far from the truth um and the last thing we're talking about is those long-term savings the long-term savings don't start after all of these things are done ideally you want to be doing all of these things at the same time but the long-term savings starts down in your savings plan in your spending plan you have to put money aside for later okay one thing we learned is that time Although, you know, we have cash and cash is king, they say, and credit is queen. Um, the most valuable coin we have to spend is time. Time is the one coin we spend that we can never get back. You can lose money, you can make it back. You can, you know, lose money, you can win it back. But once you spend time, it's gone. So there's a question I was asked, when is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago, because you want the tree already in place. When is the second best time today? You have to start today, no matter where you are, okay? Because the longer amount of time you have, the more you can accumulate, right? Because what we know is a little bit of money over a long period, period of time 
at a decent rate of return, that's what builds wealth. That's what will build your savings. And I like to give, you know, um, my clients and the people that I sit with, the families that I help, I like to give them something tangible. So if you have a phone, you can take a quick screenshot just of this example. Um, so $500 a month, that's about the average that uh, employee will put into their um, employer-sponsored retirement account, right? Over 30 years, which is about average people work on a job, depending on what age they started, at a 10% rate of return, which is close to what the S&P 500 has done over the last 20 years, will yield you $1.1 million. And you're like, okay, well, that's great. But the even better part is, in this example, you've saved only $180,000 of your own money, of your own income but you've earned $950,000 in interest, okay? Some of you may say, well, how did that happen? How did I only put in 180,000 and I have 950,000 in interest? Well, I'm glad you asked. This gentleman who most of us know, Albert Einstein, he didn't come up with this theory, but he called it the eighth wonder of the world. It's about compounding interest, okay? Compounding interest is something that we don't learn in school, that's not taught to us, but it worked for the wealthy and now it's gonna work for us. Once we know what to do and we utilize it, we too can begin to have a better financial future once we know what we're doing, okay? Compounding interest, Albert Einstein said interest, those who, who know about it, you know, earn it, those who don't pay it. Compounding interest is explained in a simple mathematical concept called the rule of 72. You take the number 72, you divide it by a rate of return, and that tells you the number of years your money takes to double. In this example, you have, um, say you start with a, a savings account, the middle, the middle number, right? Most savings accounts, I'm sure you know, you're getting less than 1%, but we'll be generous with the banks and say they give you 1%. You're 30 years old, right? And you put $10,000 into the bank. Well, with the rule of 72, 72 times one is 72. So now at the ripe old age of 100 and, what am I doing the math? 100, right? 102, whatever, doesn't matter. $20,000 was gonna buy you like a half an hour oxygen or something, it's not a lot of money. You find something more like 10%, which is a lot better right? Something that you can maybe invest in. That means your money is doubling every 7.2 years now because 72 divided by 10 is 7.2. Now, say you find something that's 24%. You might be saying, well, that's great. Where can I find that, Angela? I'm glad you asked. It's not a lot of places you can earn 24%. But you know who earns 24%? I'm sure most of you know on those credit cards that you have in your wallet average on a credit card is anywhere between 18 and 24%. So that bank that's giving you less than 1% on your savings in the bank, if you take that same rule of 72, 72 divided by 20, 24, means that every three years, a balance you owe on a credit card is doubling. Some people don't understand, well, I'm sending the minimum payment or I'm paying a little bit extra every month. I don't, it doesn't seem like the numbers are going down. It doesn't seem like I'm getting out of debt. That's why. So, in this example, this is how you learn that interest, interest can work for you or against you. So it's not only important how much money you save, but where you save, okay? Um, listed here are some of the types of retirement plans that are here. I know we have people from all over the world that are part of SESTRA now, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I'm just talking right now about what I know here in the States and employer plans. These are a list of some of those that are familiar to people. Um, these types of plans are what's called pre-tax, or you might hear the name, the word tax deferred. Um, this just means that you're taking part of your pay before it's taxed and you're putting it aside for retirement, which is good. You, as long as you're saving, you know, it's a good thing. But the, 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 the negative side to that is that you're going to have to pay taxes on that money at some point, right? So the IRS just loves that you build up all of this money and then you figure you have $500,000, that $1.1 million that we talked about in the beginning. Remember, you haven't paid taxes on it yet. And whatever the tax rate is at the time that you go to start getting distribution from that money that you saved is when you're gonna get taxed on it. So people need to understand that. 
And an alternative to deferring the taxes or paying them later is to pay them now. Anything with the name Roth on it means that you're paying your taxes up front. So when it distributes later to you in retirement, that means that it comes out tax-free because you've already paid the taxes off. Some tips, if you have one of these plans from your employer, find out if your employer matches, okay? We don't wanna leave any money on the table. If they match, that's how much you put in, not anymore. Sit down with someone who knows about retirement planning and put that percentage in to match them because you might as well gamble their money in the market while you're gambling yours and find out someplace else that's a little bit more secure that you can grow your retirement money rather than just you know kind of gambling it away. All right, another part of saving is when you put your budget together is, and you're on track to getting out of debt and you're putting all these, remember this stuff is for you. This is for you to have a better future. So you're gonna have to learn to say no to some things and to some people, right? So that you can stay in alignment with your goals. It's very important to stay on track like Angie was talking about, like Renee shared with us. It's very important to stay on track because anybody's, Somebody else's problem is not your emergency. You have a goal you're trying to reach. We're called as believers. I'm a believer. And we're called to leave a legacy for our children's children. That's, that's a spiritual legacy, a moral legacy, but that's a financial legacy as well. We're not supposed to leave our children and our grandchildren in debt because we failed to plan, because we didn't put something together when we had the time when we have the chance, because the time will go. We're called to leave an inheritance and that's what we should do. So no, it's, it's, it's an answer. Just like yes is an answer, no is an answer. Sometimes we have to say no. So let's just get the proper planning because I wanna get through this as, as you know, I don't wanna rush, but I wanna give people time to ask questions if they have at the end. So proper planning is what leads to success. And when you're talking about retirement, there's four places that you should really consider when you're saving for retirement. That's for healthcare, that's for taxes, long-term care, and family support. Those four things are major that they've, you know, they've polled seniors, and those are the four top things that you need to think about. Healthcare costs can cost over three hundred thousand dollars in your retirement, in the long term, right? It can cost you that much. People don't think about Medicare premiums or copays, the things that maybe their job was taking care of while they were working. Once you stop working, a lot of those benefits disappear with the job. Okay, some people lose their entire nest egg, some lose their homes, some have to end up deciding whether they're going to pay for their medication or whether they're going to eat. Some have had life insurance policies and they let them lapse because they had to, you know, take care of buying their medicine. And it's so unfortunate, but it happens to so many of the elderly. So we have to plan as soon as possible. Again, taxes, they don't disappear when you stop working. Some people don't know that. This is a time for you to understand that your social security benefits, they are considered income. And more, more likely than not, it's going to be taxed. And anything that you've saved for in retirement that's coming in is going to be taxed as well if you didn't do something like a Roth in the beginning. But again, if, if it's not explained to you, then you don't know. Long-term care, listen, it's, it's, it's really, really sad. But at some point, we may all need some type of long-term care. And it's not just when we're seniors. It's not only when we get older. We may break a leg and be out of work for four months. And we can't do, you know, one or two of the five daily activities of living, like bathing ourselves or cooking because we can't get around. Imagine an elderly person who lives on their own and they're not able to cook and they're not able to clean. They're not able to wash their clothes. They're not able to do things. And they need someone to assist them. Well, grandma was great when you were young because she took care of you, she baked you cookies, she took you to the park, she did all of those nice things. But now you're an adult and grandma is old and nobody is looking to say who's going to take care of grandma. She's like, oh, she always had a good job. I know she's got things in place. But if nobody sat down with her, like you have the opportunity to hear from some of these great women here on the savings team to share some of the information, these conversations are not ha being had in our community, in our homes, in our households, we only know and mimic what we learned at home. So if we weren't having these discussions at home, then we're just as lost as our parents and our grandparents were. So it's very important to put some of these things into place as soon as possible. So starts with prioritizing your goals. Think about these questions. At what age do you want to retire? Again, you can take a screenshot of this because I'm going to try to go through it quickly. Um, 
so that you know how much money you need to put away. Think about what kind of lifestyle you want to live in retirement. Do you want to live a little more sparingly than you're living now? Like you won't need as much money. Um, do you want to live the way that you're living now? You want to have the same kind of income coming in in your retirement or do you want to live lavishly? You want to you know, cruise all over the world and you want to fly your grandkids and take them all to Disney World when you get older. You have to think about those things. And here are some, some mathematical ways to figure out what those things are because the thing is that whatever amount of money you have saved now or you're thinking about saving, think about whether that's going to be enough in retirement. Because remember, the one thing that keeps coming is taxes and the other thing is inflation. It goes up every year. So $100,000, $500,000 is not going to be worth the same amount in 10 or 20 years or even five years. It's not going to be worth the same amount of money. Again, this is just something for you to think about. An example of a 30-year-old person that wants to retire at 65, right? To break everything down into months the same way you do your budget. If you earned interest on your money at around 9%, you haven't saved anything yet, this 30-year-old hasn't put anything aside for retirement yet, but wants to live on the same $150,000 a year that they're living on now. If this person expects to retire at age 65 and they're 30, that means that they will need to save at least $3 million. That's a lot of money for somebody that hasn't started yet. But again, you have to find the right vehicle for your money and you have to put your money someplace where it's gonna grow and where it can be protected. So these are some steps I put together to follow. Start today. If you haven't started saving for retirement, start today. It's never too late and you're never ever too young to start planning for your future. To have a firm financial future, it's never too early. If you're 18 to 21 year olds, they may think that you know they have a, a little side job or something, a little side hustle. Now is the time to start saving for later. Okay, speak with a financial coach or, or um, you know, sit down with someone who's willing to sit down with you and find out what your FIN number is. That's your financial independence number. Like that 30 year old in the last example, three million dollars is her FIN number. So then you have to put together a plan to get there. Review your current plan. If you have an employer-sponsored plan, find out where your money is. Find out where it's growing, how it's growing. If you're in something aggressive, if there's someplace else you can put your money in, if you want to change your options now that you, have, you know a little bit more about having something that's Roth and something that's not, okay? So everyone, thank you so much for your time. I hope that you gained value from what I shared, what the other lady shared, and I just want to wish you all a good evening and if you have any questions if we have time um maybe you'll get to answer them all i have to say is wow thank you and that yeah, was amazing. amazing yes okay, I, I, put it, I put in the chat this is a whole new world for me <laughs> so let, let me just summarize i can share my screen so then we can ask some questions after i love my team <laughs> You can see? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, to summarize, the key is, we're just going back because as I said, practice makes permanent. So we are going to practice. Remember, change your mindset, be intentional, be disciplined, create a budget, create a budget, create a budget. Track your spending, save for retirement so you can have a peace of mind. Save, save, save. There is no excuses. And I found this little thing that I just wanna read because affirmation is very good. When you focus on a set goal, one of two things will happen. Either you will meet your goal or you will not. When you reset your goal, 10 to 20% above set goal, one or two things will happen. Either you will meet your goal or you will exceed. In conclusion, let your money grow old. What's old money? The Rockefellers, Vanderbilt, the Kennedys, Bloomberg, the Buffett, Gates, Zuckerberg, they're considered new money. They're billionaire, but they're considered new money. Old money is generational, and generational means three generations. Therefore, 
let's develop a financial confidence sisterhood. And I just did some things for you guys. Renee talked about a few of them, the M envelopes, some of these things. If you, we have everything at our fingertips. There's no excuse anymore to say, well, I don't know how. Again, as Angie said, we can make a screenshot of this. You can watch the video again and you can pause it and you can get all of this information. We're just trying to help you. So now if you have any questions, thank you so much for allowing us into your space and for giving us your time. So we open up the floor for questions. Thank you, thank guys. You guys. Um, Stephanie, there was, was a, there was a few questions on Facebook. Are you gonna are you gonna answer those questions? You you keep saying I don't see any questions on Facebook. I don't. I'm not seeing. I just saw. Hi, Stephanie. Okay. Was that speaker? Could you ask me what financial plan should someone make if they have to go on disability due to illness? I may have to go on SSDI due to my speech issues. Hmm. Did you guys get that? Yeah, um, well, I'll answer that one. Uh, the thing to look into, it's never too late, but that's why it's so important to plan beforehand because you want to be prepared in case of an emergency, in case something like this happens. I'm sure that there are, you know, other maybe social programs that might be able to help um, in getting some kind of assistance, but likely if there's something that you're looking to, to get at this point and you already have a diagnosis and you know that a time is coming when you're going to have to receive some kind of services, if it's, you know, applying or, you know, putting in an application for long-term care or critical care, things like that, those, again, it's insurance and, they're gonna take a look at your medical history and you may get denied at this point. So that's why people are young and healthy and not even really thinking about it. The mindset has to change from what we know and what we've been set at, you know, as an example for most of us, not all, because like someone like Carol Medwinter had, you know, someone in her life from very young telling her what she should do with her money giving her money an assignment, making sure that she was saving. So I don't know exactly what you may be able to do now, but you you know, it doesn't hurt to just reach out and see what other services may be available to you should you have to stop working. I'm sorry that this is happening now, but I hope that was helpful. Um, thank you. And I, I, I had asked the question, how has using the met these methods, Renee spoke about the different apps that are out there. And I, and I asked the question, how has it, um, how has it helped you? And she said, it helps her to monitor how much she's spending in different categories and adjust her spending when needed. Um, but so does that, I mean, I wanna know, do you spend less because of it? Do you think you spend less because of it? Sure. So this is Renee jumping back on. I'd say, um, you know, there's a lot that's been talked about and a lot of things that I employ personally. So like one of my big financial philosophies is living below your means. So I try to be in a position where I know my household expenses like rent, mortgage, et cetera, are not going to be anything that's going to put me in a situation where I'm negative each month. So from a big picture standpoint, I start with St structuring my finances in a way that sets me up for success. The apps come in and they help me to know where the money is going. Like, and personally, like I try to be relatively flexible in it. I don't want to be constrained, but I do want to make sure that I am saving money and putting money away. And again, by living below my means, that sort of guarantees I have the capacity to save on a regular basis. So for me, the tracking is just knowing where it's going. And if I do feel I'm spending too much in a particular area, I can cut back. Or if there's something like a short-term goal that I wanna save for, um, you know, I can know where I can cut from to put money towards that. So for me, it's the discipline of it and understanding where the money is going and being able to see it at any given moment, just pulling it up on my phone and knowing, okay, this is what's going on. 
Awesome. Awesome. You know, that spending below your means, that's kind of my, the way I do it. <laughs> I'm not very disciplined and I'm not very organized, but I just say, you know what? I'm staying below, below my, my means. I am not trying to be living up with the Joneses. So thank you. Okay. So we have some comments here by Carol. She said she switched to cash only two years ago. It's quite liberating. Um, and we have a, we have a, a comment says, I, I see how that can work. Credit cards are the devil. <laughs> um, and, and somebody, oh, and Carol said, why do you think some are called MasterCard? That's a good one. I've never seen that one before. Um, so yeah, any, anyone else have any questions? Can I say one more thing um, regarding the, um, the secure credit card? Um, Angela Edwards talked about it. We learned about that in our last session we took that um, because I thought what I thought it was, it wasn't, they change it a bit now, I think because it's putting your own money in the bank. For example, you $500, you're the one who control that $500. So when that is finished, it's finished because you're using your own money and you can put as much into it. At the same time, you're building your credit, your credit score without using the other card to build your credit score because you're putting, you're using your money as a secure card and you're still building your credit score at the same time. And it helps you to track your money because then if you're spending it, once it's complete, it's a complete, but you have to find the right bank that will work with you. Just check out the right banks. I just um, wanted to add that. Um, there's a, a question here is, can you purchase critical care insurance to help with expenses if you become ill? I know someone, I think it was Angela that said that you have to, you know, you, you, should, get, you should make these investments and stuff when you're younger because you may not, um, be able to get any, get some kind of coverage. But what do you, what do you say about that? Well, the, I mean, the attempt can be made. It's, it's sitting down with uh, a licensed, you know, financial person and putting it, you know, applying and seeing if it would work. I mean, somebody that knows would be able to tell you better. So it's better to sit down with someone. I mean, I sit down with families. If, you, if you're on Sestra now, you can find me in my website in the marketplace and, you know, it's, go to my link and we can set up an appointment and sit down and see if there's something that can be done other than, you know, those free social services that might be available to you. I'm not really sure because each individual, you know, is different. So I don't want to just give you a, just a blatant like, yeah. yes or no. Um, we have to see what your circumstances are and see if there's anything that's, you know, that can be done. I'm willing to have the conversation. Thank you. Also, Angela, um, for those of us who work within corporations, I know that my company, you can check with your company um, if they offer the critical care insurance because my company offers it. And I've always, um, and the premium, if you go through the company is 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 pretty small. I think it's like, for me, it's like $19, $20 a month and the company pays a portion of it. So check with your employer to see if they offer the critical care. Um, usually you get it around the time that they have the open enrollment, yes. but you can check to see if they offer. And I think there is something that says that if you have like a pre-existing condition that it might be difficult for you to get it, but check the, the, it, the premium is very small, $20, $30 a month. Right. There's okay. some more questions there. Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. Norma asks, which application for tracking is the most user-friendly and for beginners? Sure. Um, so this is Renee coming back again. Um, I would say it's important to know your personality with using the apps. For me, I know that, sorry, my daughter's here in the background. But um, for me, I know that more information, more detail is welcome. And I like that. For someone else, like one of my good friends, we've had conversations around budgeting. That's overwhelming for her. So I think it is important to understand what works well for you and what your appetite is. And if you want all the details and all the information, I personally like 
um, YNAB. Another one that has a simpler interface that you can use that gets a lot of good reviews is Mint. Um, I do have a account. I don't necessarily use it as much, but it is something that you can use and you could connect it to your accounts and there's no um, fee with that, or there is a free version with Mint um, that you can use. So I think it's really just knowing your personality, knowing what your appetite is. And based on that, finding the tool that supports you where you are. And just to add to that, um, Renee mentioned about uh, aligning with your accounts. If you don't want it connected to your bank accounts, you find the one that where you're just entering the information yourself rather than have it linked to your bank account. Again, it depends on what is most comfortable for you, what you're willing to work with, uh, and whether or not you do have that appetite for more detail, or if you want it to be as simple as possible. Okay, thank you. There was another question that says, is it recommended to only utilize a credit card or two monthly for set expenses such as gas, groceries, et cetera, that are manageable in order to maintain a good credit score? Um, I would say yes, providing that you know that you're disciplined enough to pay it off within a reasonable time span. It's, I know it's they said to pay it off every month immediately, but that might work against you because they're looking for history to see if you're responsible. So getting, if you charge something on a card right now, this one, and you pay it off at the end, your core, your score, it affects your score because you're saying that you're not responsible enough because then you're not, there's nothing revolving. So they would like to see that you have a balance. So keep it for two months. And if you pay half this month, pay the other half the next month. So they want to see that you are not just putting it and paying it because then they say you're not responsible then. So they want to see that at least if you have it for two months or even three months. So they say, oh, this person is responsible. If they should get a mortgage or something like that, we see that they can actually do it and be consistent. So they look for that. So it's okay to have that. However, if you are disciplined enough, you can do it. If you know that you're not, I would not recommend it. Thank you. I had a question. I'm going to be 47 next month. And is there any hope for me to start now? <laughs> Today, today, Annette, today, I said that today is the day. Get it done. To Get it start. done. Yes. It's never too late. And I just wanted to say, like, because you guys are all sophisticated. I'm telling you, the things that I do to save money is my kids have no problems learning their cousins' hand me downs. You know, um, that's right. I, I, I um, I do things like making sure that, you know, making sure that I'm not overspending my food and just being conscious about, about how to spend and, 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 and teaching my children the value of, well, not the value, but teaching them to not be materialistic. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I mean, you know, we're by no means poor, right? But I did not want to have them be, you know, crazy about designer clothes and stuff like that. Yep. And so I think that I've done a pretty good job at that with them, but they're not materialistic. And so, you know, those kind of core values are important to instill in the children. I think that's something that I gave them, a legacy that I love. <laughs> there are some more questions before we, we're getting close to um, nine o'clock, I mean, to eight o'clock. Uh, Paulette says, could you ask for me, what financial plan should someone make if they have, oh, did we already ask that one? We did. Nope. Okay. Um, Crown One says, I switched to cash as we, how does that build my credit if my cards are fully paid and I'm using only cash? Is that, do you understand the question? Yes. This is why I say it's okay to use your card to help you make sure you're you keep that credit. However, when you do use that, you don't have to use it to pay cash for everything because you can use your card and charge something provided that you know that you have the cash to pay for it. If you have the cash to pay for it in advance, yes. Use your card, especially if it's for a large spending. Use it for a large ticket item, but not just for daily things um, such as going to the grocery store. I would not recommend it for that. But if you're going to get something, a gift or something larger, then use it because you know that you have the cash to pay it and then do pay it. Right. And like I was saying earlier with the um, that compounding interest, learning how you know to earn it instead of paying it. 
the important part is to make sure that you're not paying interest. If you have the cash to pay for things, great. If you find a credit card where they have perks, where you'll get, if you know you go on vacations, ones that'll give you um, points, you know, or you buy gas and they'll give you, you know, more points or something like use one of those types of cards. Mm -hmm. And there's a trick that I heard about and I've been using it and it automatically will boost your credit rating is if you have that cash, you find that card that gives you the perks that fit your lifestyle, right? When, whatever your due date is for your bill, pay a portion of it 15 days before it's due and then pay the balance three days before it's due. Because mm-hmm. you have the cash, you're gonna pay it off. But if you use that 15 and three, automatically they're gonna wanna increase it. They're automatically gonna wanna increase your credit yeah. limit. And as soon as they do that, that's gonna boost your credit score. Correct. But remember, like Diane said, do not spend more money than you have to pay that card. Use the card strategically, yeah. build up that credit, use that money and then big ticket item like you know go in with somebody and, and, and purchase a property like build up your credit and do something where your money can make money for you you want to put your money on assignment you want your money to be earning interest you want your money to be making money while you're sleeping you don't want to have to worry about not sleeping because you can't pay your bills that credit is serious it's serious there are more it questions be- angela oh, sorry um, there's questions in the chat, but I'll, I'll take the Facebook first. Winston says, I only use my debit card. If it's not in there, I don't spend it. I work off a budget and very rarely deviate. I also have been doing the saving that I was posted. If came in handy the other day when I needed to get a plumber in, she asked, is it too late to get long-term or short-term insurance? There's no more questions. I assume she means life insurance. I'll take that question again. Again, it's an individual type of thing. My, you know, again, if you're Ancestry now, my my website is there in the marketplace. You can go to the website and you can set up an appointment. Um, You can reach out to me Um, on Sestra. You can send me a message and um, we can try to sit down and set something up. Everyone's case is individual and different. And I don't want to just give a blatant answer or a, you know, a blank answer and it's not the right thing for you. Okay, some more questions in the chat. Um, the cards are so predatory. Why, if I have a high balance, they keep increasing, they continue to increase my spending limit. Because they're following your trend. They track everything. They track you and that's why because they see that you're doing that and you're paying at the same time and you're spending at the same time. So what they do, they'll boost your credit so you will spend more. Right. It's a trap. Mm-hmm. Don't call for it. Right, and that's why okay. you, you can call back. them and tell them, no, please stop it. You can yeah. put it on hold actually. Okay, we're coming, to, we're eight o'clock, we're over time. This is such an exciting and uh, informative uh workshop. So what I'm going to ask is that our savings team make do helpful posts on a regular basis and share how the members can contact you. Obviously there's a need for what you have in the, in those in that brain of yours. Your your sisters need you. So I'm going to ask you to to create regular posts especially with that tip Angela Henry just gave um about pay 15 and then something about 3. I like to catch that. Princess all of you guys, Angie, this has been so helpful. You need to do regular posts because your sisters need you. So post and put your information out there regularly so that they can reach out to you. And it's true, the marketplace is there for everyone's use. Go to the marketplace, connect with your sisters. We have a lot of financial advisors. You can get information on investments, savings, retirement, insur- life insurance, whatever you like. They are on the marketplace and they're here to service you. And if anyone is listening and you have that expertise, please contact us or complete the form at www.sestranow.com, the marketplace, so that you too can be of service to your sisters. I just want to thank everyone tonight. And we're demonstrating what Sestranow is all about, sisters helping sisters. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. It was an awesome presentation. Thank you for joining. (laughs)
Okay, I'm gonna thank you for joining us, everyone. We're gonna stop the recording now.